Good afternoon. I'd like to bring up my uh, panelists for the stage. Uh, I've got Ewan Murray, Chief Executive of the Sustainability Consortium. Kathleen McLaughlin, Chief Sustainability Officer for Walmart and President of the Walmart Foundation. And Jonathan Atwood, Vice President, Sustainable Living and Corporate Communications for Unilever. Welcome all. Thank you. Thank you, John. So, so we're here to talk about greening global supply chains. And the, the impetus for this was a report that was put out by the Sustainability Consortium, Greening Global Supply Chains, From Blind Spots to Hot Spots to Action. And you can go on their website and download it. So we're not going to go and read through this for you or tell you any, uh, anything from it specifically. What we want to do today is talk about how to get behind the data here and what really made this come together. So you and I think we'll start with you and just what do you mean by an impact report, 2016 impact report? What does that mean and what are some examples of that? Great, thank you. Hello, everybody. So as a nonprofit organization, we're driven by our mission, and that's to use the best available sustainability science to help companies make the products we all use every day better, more sustainable. And so this is really about prosperity. Consumer products are, uh, come with a huge benefit to, to us in society in the West. They're a big part of what makes us prosperous. And yet we also know that they come with huge costs. So roughly two thirds of deforestation globally comes from the consumer goods supply chain. About 80% of water withdrawals, 60% of greenhouse gases. And companies have a role, a responsibility even to do something about this. And yet we also know that the companies that take action now are safeguarding their future prosperity too. You know, as Jonathan likes to say, all of the future growth is going to be green growth. And so for us, impact really is about driving prosperity, driving growth by decoupling it from the social and environmental aspects of our world. And so we published the impact report last year with data from several retailers, thousands of brands, manufacturers, suppliers. And in 2017, in a couple of months, we'll release the next chapter of that. And really, the, the high level findings are that the world very neatly falls into two groups. There are leaders and there are laggards. And really, there's not really very many people in the middle. So quick word on the leaders, and we've got two of them up here on stage today, but really pretty well all the companies in the room are put in that group. And these leading companies we see are doing well on greenhouse gases, but they're the same companies who are doing well on water, the same companies who are doing well on deforestation and worker rights and child labor and so on. And that's probably not really much of a surprise. But what was a pleasant surprise was that we also see those that are doing well on sustainability are also doing well commercially. And in the retail context, you know, that's suppliers who are um, uh, lower waste, they're higher replenishment, they're lower return rates, and so on. And so for the first time, we were able to properly link sustainability performance and commercial performance. And then the second group are laggards. The first thing to note about them is these groups aren't the same size. So we have data on how well companies understand the issues in their value chain. And there's about 20% are our leaders. They have good visibility. But more than half have no visibility at all. In 2017, after decades of scientific research and NGO pressure and consumer action and so on, half know nothing. And that's a huge opportunity that's missed environmentally, socially, and of course, commercially too. So I'll finish with just a quick example of that, if I can, to bring it to life. 
we ask about greenhouse gases in manufacturing, and we got the most brilliant response back from a supplier. They said, you asked us about greenhouse gases in manufacturing. We make t-shirts. We don't have any greenhouses. <laughs> and if we're to solve this, those are the people we have to get to to really move the needle. OK, you and I hadn't heard that one. Um, Kath Kathleen, I think a lot of the perception of Walmart is that they can just say something and everyone sits up and does it and, and okay, problem solved. But I've been following Walmart since, you know, first discussions with Andy Rubin, you know, years and years ago. And that's a big ship to turn, right? It doesn't happen overnight. So how have you been communicating with your suppliers up the supply chain and how far back are you trying to go when you're doing that? Well, what you alluded to and, and you and commented on as well is the uh, incredible social and environmental impact of our consumption. You know, we all eat food, we wear clothes most of the time, um, and these things have a real impact. So we have to find a way to make consumption truly sustainable. So um, more and more, we're trying to go back farther and farther and have visibility all the way back in the chain. Our, our goal is tra to transform the way products get produced and push through retail into the hands of customers and then even get used and then what happens at the end of life, right? So we're trying to make it truly circular. And to do that, we have to look at the whole chain fully end to end. And what's been great about the sustainability index, and, and that's what Ewan was talking about, is um, we've been able to use it as a tool to just start to get some of that visibility. We have a long way to go. As you said, you know, too often the answer is, I do not know to the questions. But basically the way this thing works is, Life cycle analyses across 150 some you know, categories of products that, um, that get, get consumed. And we ask our suppliers to fill out a survey um, answering the 12 to 15 most critical questions about sustainability in each of those categories that's relevant to them. So um, you know, those are social indicators and environmental indicators on emissions, waste, deforestation, water withdrawals, you know, the questions about labor, um, questions around safe chemistry, um, you know, the full gamut of social and environmental issues. And I'm, I'm happy to say that this year we cracked 70% of our COGS base um, that is surveyed responding. 70% of our volume. That's $200 billion in COGS just for Walmart. And because these suppliers are describing their whole supply chain, it's not just what they're selling to Walmart, it's what they're selling to anybody. We figure that's anywhere from two to four trillion dollars worth of food, um, you know, consumer products in, in the global economy that's covered now by this index. It's an incredible tool. So, um, you know, to answer your question, yeah, we want to go back as far as we can. And so that survey gives us a snapshot of how different categories are performing and what the hotspots are, and it allows us to do a couple things. One is work with suppliers to discuss continuous improvement in their categories and understand what are they doing on some of the issues, whether it's animal welfare or sustainable chemistry um, or emissions in their factories or greenhouses, <laughs> as the case may be. Um, but we also use it to pinpoint where we can uh, focus our energy on special initiatives. And we try to come at things from a whole system perspective. So we're working on you know, Thai shrimp or if we're working on um, you know, produce in the North American corridor, if we're working on shampoo. We're trying to look end to end at the full suite of, of big hot spots and address them. That change requires behavior change of every single actor involved in that supply chain, including, by the way, the customers. So to your point, no, it's, I, I wish it was a world where we could just say, hey, we want people to do X and everybody would do it. It doesn't work that way at all. But um, what we try to do is figure out what combination of supplier initiatives, um, you know, government action, philanthropy, activism, you know, what are all of the um, tools in the toolbox that we can apply with other leaders in the system simultaneously to accelerate change? And that's what we try to do in, in, in each of the chains. Um, you know, I think that question of transparency, visibility to the data, that is our single biggest challenge right now, in, in my view, in sustainability, is getting um, that visibility. And, you know, I think the index has really made a huge contribution to the field and helping us move in that direction, so. <laughs> Tremendous. We uh, held a transparency summit 
this morning with a number of different uh, brand holders and suppliers and NGOs. And the, the key coming out of it is around collaboration as well as getting deep visibility into the supply chain. So Jonathan, as someone on the other end of that request from Kathleen and her team, what, what is Unilever doing? How are they driving back into their supply chain? And also, how are you communicating with Walmart? Does it give you an advantage? Well, well the first thing I'd say is that when Kathleen or Laura Phillips calls, we take their call. Um, <laughs> but that's not where the story completely ends. And I, and I think it's important to say that our involvement in the Sustainability Consortium for since the inception, I think, 2009, mm, yeah. has been, you know, as partner with Walmart and other companies, Mars and Pepsi and others that are in that group, um, in, in a very similar journey. I think, that, I think the group is now expanding, which is exciting. I think we're at a tipping point moment, quite honestly, and I think the report is, is the first step to say that we're now talking about impact. We're not talking about identification of blind spots or hot spots. I mean, I think that's kind of table stakes, quite honestly. I think the story now is about what are we going to do about it? And are we going to come together as a group and, and, and decide that we're actually going to move this forward in a, in a much more dramatic way? And so your word collaboration, I think that's exactly where we are. And, and the way that I take a, an input from Walmart or a question back into Unilever is, is, is quite different, actually, over the last several years. It used to be, I would say, kind of a CSR with a CSR group kind of conversation, quite honestly. And now, uh, when we get into a conversation, I go back to Unilever, and I'm in a conversation with procurement and finance and the marketers and you know a whole host of people within our supply chain to kind of talk about it and see where, where these different inputs and, and actions can be taken at different points within Unilever. You know, we're taking, we're taking a long-term view on many of these things. We take a, a great deal of accountability for our supply chain. We've done a full life cycle assessment of our company. We know where all of our impacts are. It doesn't mean that we've got them solved. It doesn't mean that we're making enough progress. We're not. But I, I would say the energy is different. The energy feels different now. And it's, and it's more than just responding to a Walmart request as the reason to do something. I think the impetus was there, and it was right, and it was just. But I think for us, and I think for all of us, I think the idea has to be that we're going to go together now into kind of uncharted waters and look at these scope three kind of impacts you know, Kathleen doesn't want to know about my solar panels on my building. That's, that's interesting, but not that interesting. The bigger interest is in our deeper supply chains, those communities that we're affecting all around the world. That's human beings, that's economics, that's social, that's environmental. When you start to think of it that way, and, and that's how we're thinking about it, it really starts to answer the question, what are we in business for? You know, we've been quite clear that we're in business to serve society. We have brands that have a purpose, and if you don't have a purpose and you don't know what you're standing for in society, you really have to question what you're doing and, and why we're selling that product. So it, I think it all ties together quite nicely. The report is wonderful. I think Ian will, you, you, probably, you and you'll probably tell about the fact that we have more reports coming. I think the reports are important. I think the most important thing is that we are at a moment now in time where we can actually create huge change if we decide to. This, is, this cannot be a story of the, the, quote, leaders leading the way and, and, and thinking that we're going to have this massive change again on the world. We're not. We need collective action. We need different kinds of collaborations, people stepping in and saying, we want this too. So a huge and change, but also being financially sound, right? We, we think it's one and the same. Right. We, we don't think that you can do one and, and, and get away with the other. We don't think that you can be financially sound and disregard supply chains. It just doesn't work that way. That may have been the way it was, at some level, that is not the way forward. If I can just comment on that. I mean, that's the big um, discussion in business right now is the fact that you can't just look at short term. You have to look at long term in, in the markets. And by the way, you can't separate economic issues from social issues and environmental issues. Those days are gone. So um, the interplay across those issues is such that you have to solve everything simultaneously. I just want to spend like an hour up here, but I know they're not going to let us. Elaine. Uh, do we have a question from the audience? We have many questions. Um, so one question is, uh, well, the context is that this is a very first world oriented supply chain discussion. So can you address ways in which you take into account culture differences? Jonathan, you want to start with that? I mean, you source from around the world. So we do. I'm not sure how this is a first world discussion, but take yeah, a shot. I did, 
<laughs> I, I guess I would challenge that, that assumption. I mean, our supply chain is, uh, is extensive. We're in pretty much most countries around the world in terms of our supply chain. Um, the issues on the ground in the communities that we're serving through our supply chains, those issues do change. So if we're talking about sourcing out of India or sourcing out of Asia, we might be talking about health and sanitation within our supply chain. Um, but I don't think that we, we distinguish one, one geography over another. We just, we just want to get focused on impacts at the earliest part of the supply chain, if you will, and, and work our way back. What I would say, um, we're also a global company, 28 countries. Um, the, uh, the issues are universal. The um, context and the pace you can move at and which issues are relatively more important in one place versus another are, are, are different. So for example, in China, we're working quite extensively on food safety. And we're talking about basic blocking and tackling to make poultry safe or pork safe, very different from the US context. Or if you look at Mexico, we're at about 60% renewable or clean energy in our operations in Mexico. Uh, and that's much higher than we'd even find in the United States. Different regulatory context, different market. So there is certainly variation, but these are universal issues. I mean, everybody wants to have clean air and <laughs> lower emissions and less waste and healthy products. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to ask one last question because I'm watching the clock tick away. And Kathleen, I'm going to start with you. Do consumers care? We always hear about, well, once consumers wake up and decide that this is important, we'll drive it. But you've been doing a lot of things where, you know, was it, was it chicken or egg? Did, did you do things and then consumers cared? Are you seeing a consumer driver for this? Consumers are increasingly aware of the challenges. And if you ask them about any of these issues, they will say, yes, I, I care very much. When you give them real trade-offs and their economic implications, not as much. And that's, you know, that's just a, a reality. Um, you know, for many people, they're thinking about how do they stretch their budget to pay for their food or, or what have you. Um, and so sometimes, if they feel they have to make trade-offs, they will. What we're trying to do, um, and I think Annie talked about this earlier, um, is take some of those choices away, just make it easier. So the light bulbs that you're buying that you can afford are the LED light bulbs. And the shampoo that you're buying has chemicals of concern taken out. Um, so that's something we're trying to do is just continuously improve and make the sustainable choice also the economic choice. It requires um, what you were talking about, which is collective action to rewire the way that we produce the products. Right, so it's not about saying, well, there's a certain way we do it today, let's add on cost to make it more sustainable. It's saying, well, there's a way we do it today. How do we reimagine the way we do it to make it sustainable from an environmental point of view, a social point of view, and an economic point of view for the customer? And that, that's how we approach it. Okay, they're going to kick us off the stage, but one <laughs> quick sentence from each of you. What's the best advice you can give all these sustainability leaders for greening their supply chain? Really short and fast. Ewan. Uh, thank you. So... Hopefully my greenhouse example illustrates a wider point, that there's actually a real risk that we end up living in the bubble, that we're, we're preaching to the converted, and this group of leaders does all the right things, but we leave everyone else behind. So the thing to do is get out there and talk to your suppliers, ask them questions, ask them questions about their suppliers, and when you get responses, ask more questions and keep asking questions. And that okay. way we get everyone engaged. Kathleen? So for the sustainability leaders in the room, um, I would say find the issues that are most relevant for your customers and your business and figure out the business argument, the economic argument for why you should tackle those, not just the environmental and the social argument. And for some people, it may be reputation. Others, it may be supply security, risk, cost structure, revenue streams, competitive advantage. Find the business argument so that you can rally the people in your organization behind it in that kind of holistic way I was talking about. So environmental, social, yes, but also economic, and engage on those issues in that way. Jonathan. Since they took my answer, I'll give you a different one, and that is think of the, an NGO that has something to say about your company, perhaps not something nice, and invite them out for dinner and ask them to talk to you about what they see within your company, take it on board, and look to address it. Great. Thank you all. Good. Let's Thanks. give a big hand of applause.